good morning. Good morning. I went and turned off coal again. That's what I get for planting garden yesterday. <laughs> no, but it'll be all right. Yeah, I had a discussion with my neighbor yesterday. She was afraid that it was going to be a heavy frost again. I said, I think we're past heavy frost or killing frost. We may be, may have frost, but I don't know. The farmer's almanac said we were past the heavy frost or killing frost. So it's been right many, many times. We've got blackberry winters over on there. Blackberry winter. They go on there, aren't they? Yep. And then, then there was a year they had the killing frost about the middle of May. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just take my chances because there's nothing that's not close enough to the house. I can't throw a blanket over it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So. All right. So today is the fifth Sunday. It's October. Or it's uh, October. <laughs> wow. It'll be here before we know it. It's April 30th. <laughs> and so uh, today is lunch at Las Brisas together. Um, I don't know how we want to do this. Do we want to try to sit at one table or do we want to just go in and just kind of just sit wherever? And, and they're often pretty good about liking both tables together. Um, yeah, they have the big long ones. They have the big long ones. I think just go and we'll say, oh, we're them and we move them together. But depending on how many it goes, we may not be able to get a big enough table either. So. Uh, we'll just meet over at Las Barisas afterwards, and I would say just it's fellowship time. Um, if you need to be somewhere, go ahead and order and go ahead and eat. We'll just talk as we come and go. I mean, uh, if that works for everybody, because uh, sometimes if you have a huge group, they wait and bring all the food out at once, and then the first person's is really cold, and the last person's is, you know, you sit there for an hour waiting for them to bring out all the food and all that. So uh, Mexican food is not real good if it's cold. So, unless it's on a hot plate. We could. Who else trying to plan to go just today? Scare them to death. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, we're looking at about twenty then. It could be twenty-two. Twenty-two. Okay. So twenty-two or so. Yeah, we might need to do that. If he can get him to answer the phone. That's well, another. they don't open till eleven. They don't open until 11. So, who wants to volunteer to call it? Judy? <laughs> George volunteers by, by way of Judy. <laughs> I, I think we, we don't necessarily have to be at one continuous table, do we? I mean, a couple of we, we, because 20 is a lot to get in, or 20 is a lot to get in one place. So. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to my chicken soup, and I have been ever since last week when somebody mentioned it. <laughs> So, we never had it. All right. So, this um, one thing I do need to know if anyone's graduating this semester, um, if, if, please let me know. I know we have one college graduate. I'm not sure about it. Who? Uh, Chloe. Uh, actually, CTC, but uh, she's graduating with, uh, uh, I don't know what they call it at that point, but uh, respiratory therapy. Okay. So, when we get the feet right back down, we'll get. Week, I, no, not next week. Weeks, 17, so, whatever. 17. 17. Well, if you don't mind to write that down, I'll okay. get it announced. I'm just trying to get prepared for what the closer to the time. But uh, uh, I don't know if we have anybody out in, in the church graduating. Lydia. Oh, I said we had one graduate student. Lydia will be. But uh, yeah, she didn't. I've but, but I'll be happy to recognize anybody that's going to graduate. That's not an issue. But I just don't want to leave anybody out. Let's put it that way, okay? All right, so this coming Friday night is Church London United. It is uh, here at 6 o'clock. Uh, we are the host church, and uh, I'm sure they would be happy to have anyone come and join them. Um, Susan Linicky has been a member of that for many, many years, and um, it's a neat, my two aunts usually are here, et cetera, so it would be an uh, opportunity for 6 o'clock, just uh, they eat, and they uh, have a a program of some type, but I'm not that familiar with Church Women United. I know it's been around for quite a while, so, but that's uh, Friday night at 6 o'clock. Yes? Mom, let me ask, uh, does everybody know that her and Candy are preparing most of the meal? It'd be okay to eat, don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she and Candy are doing most of the meal. So, well, I will say there are times, though, when I go to potlucks that you, you walk by and you wonder, who made that? <laughs> or what, what is that? <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> so, Okay, uh, so next Sunday will be uh, uh, communion, and if it's okay with the, the council members, I just talked to Kathy, we may move the church council meeting to next Sunday. We usually have it the second Sunday, but that's going to be Mother's Day, and so a lot of times people want to get jet out 
um, to go for Mother's Day things, or they've got lunch or something, so I'm, I'm seeing head shakes. So we'll just do it next Sunday. I don't think it'd be a long meeting in any way. Uh, if, and if you can't make it, that's fine. We'll fill you in. But uh, it's a uh, Mother's Day is kind of the time when you traditionally hit the lunch spots and things. So we'll just plan on that. After that, we're down to uh, Memorial Day services on the 28th, and we will be uh, kind of doing our Memorial Day service out at the cemetery, uh, as we always do. So, anything else that I've missed as far as announcements? Birthdays? Today, it's the 30th, so I'm going to have to split pages here. Because there was nobody on April 30th. Let's see what May brings. May flowers, which bring pilgrims. <laughs> Bernie Davis Ron has a birthday. Mm -hmm. Tuesday. Uh, Mackenzie Daniel has one on Wednesday. Christian Maestro Creator on Thursday. Ethan Licks and Dale Kutcher on Friday. Casey, er, Casey Sander on Saturday. And then that'll take us to next week. So we have, let's see, Dale and Bernita are both here. So we'll go Bernita and Dale because that's alphabetical work. No favorite doesn't hear. <laughs>
case, you drop to the bottom. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. <coughs> Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain. All sufficient grace for you and me. And then it switches to the bottom line. Broader than the scope of my turn. Or I'm sorry, to the top line. You're on the bottom line for the first two and then the top line for the last two. It gets a little confusing, but it's a cool song. Okay? So just <coughs> buckle up and hang on. <laughs> So they came to dinner that night and we didn't even recognize that they were dressed up. 
what kind of pets we, we thought they were kind of sloppy people, <laughs> you know. And this woman comes in with all her makeup and her hair done and this beautiful dress and all this, and we're like, has she been with us all week? And then we, she said, our luggage got here. <laughs> and they had actually asked it just to be shipped back home because by the time they found where it lives at, was going to be everything they said just ship it back home it's not worth and they didn't listen to that either and they didn't listen to that either they shipped it to the hotel and it got there they i think the, the luggage got there at like 5 45 and they left at 11 45 to fly out <laughs> that evening so but she got to wear her nice dress one night so but, uh, that was kind of a shame um so keep all those in your, your prayers anybody else that i'm uh, forgetting yes Catherine. um i just got a check this morning i'm going to cry one of the girls her stepfather committed suicide Oh. Last night, they found him this morning. You're uh, one of your students? One of my, uh, one of my co-workers. Your co-workers. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of your co-workers. All right. Yes, yes, Paula. And um, Jim Young uh, passed away Friday evening. A lot of people know him from Optimus Club, uh, History Center, Southeast Health mm -hmm. Point, um, Beagle World. I mean, he was big in the community. Okay. That was uh, Friday evening. Friday evening. I don't know him. I mean, if I saw him, I may recognize him. Yeah. My aunt Darlene decided she was going to clean out the ditch across the road from her house, and she fell and broke her shoulder. <clears throat> and so she had surgery Friday. She was feeling pretty good Friday night because they had used a nerve block, and so she wasn't feeling any pain. But I'm kind of pretty sure she's feeling pain by now. So if you could remember her. <clears throat> Thanks, Paula, for the beautiful iris. I always think of when I lived in Potosi for four years, because in Potosi they called them, do you remember? Flags. 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 Mm -hmm. And it made sense because the French flag is the fleur de lis, or the, the iris. That uh, fleur de lis state is the iris state, that's what it is. So they call them flags. Wow, you looked there longer than I did, and I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they call them blacks. I think because Rhonda Ferris liked them so much that she lived, she was just catty cornered from me there. And uh, there was a whole patch of them right there in front of Bill, Mer uh, Bill Mayberry's house. I know we're leaving y'all out of this conversation, but he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, there was a lot of um, iris, and I always thought iris were a beautiful, beautiful flower. And just a uh, once a year kind of thing, but they're beautiful. So, anybody else? Anything good happened this week? Yes. I saw that. A mm -hmm. pole vaulting scholarship. Pole vaulting, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, I saw that. Because actually, one of her coaches, I know, oh. Ryan Long, uh, his mom Susan was my other assistant principal at Saxon for many years. So I've met Ryan several times. So, yeah. yes. Lydia gets to be not an honorary. She is going to be carrying the banner for the Liberal Arts, School of Liberal Arts, for graduation on the 13th of May. Yes. She found that out this week, so. He was chosen not only for the history department, but for the whole School of Liberal Arts. So she will be what's called the honorary marshal, which means you get to carry the banner, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, gives her a purpose to be there because she wasn't going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Say a couple prayers for Lydia. She's a little anxious right now. She's Her, her advisor is in uh, England, and then his dad had emergency surgery Friday night, and she's got a thesis defense coming up, and she's having trouble getting some of those people to respond back on what needs to be done. And anybody that's been to college know they don't always work that quickly. <laughs> so uh, she's a little stressed out, but I, I assure her it's, it's going to be good, and if they ask you to be the honorary <laughs> marshal, they're not too worried about the graduation <laughs> process. <laughs> You're going through there one way or another. <laughs> that's, that's simple. So. Anything else? Yeah. Nick interviewed for an FFA mm -hmm. office, me, I that. Mm -hmm. and he will be the assistant chaplain. Assistant chaplain, awesome. which is good for a sophomore. Because mm -hmm. most of the time, the, the officers go to the, to the upper class. Uh, so, thank you. It's a proud of you, Nick. Good for you. So, anybody else? Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you today on a chilly morning, on a day that you remind us that cool weather and sunshine are all intertwined, that beautiful days come with not so beautiful days, and as the quote from the Easter sermon said, if we live in sunshine all the time, we have not, eventually have nothing but a desert. And thank you for reminding us that sometimes we have to go through the valleys to reach the mountaintops. Father, we come as a group of people praying for those that are ill and sick and the various different things that have happened to people. 
We pray that you'll continue to be with them and guide them and hold them in your hands. And get them through sorrowful situations. Help them through illnesses. Help them recover from whatever they're having. And we continue to pray that you'll be with each one that is in need. Father, we also come as a church and as a group of people asking that you bless each of us. That there's nothing wrong with that, asking to be blessed, and that you bless this church, that you help continue the, the, our work in this world, and that we can continue to grow and be a part of the world and represent you and carry on your gospel to other people. Father, we pray also that you'll continue to be with each of us as we go through our lives. All too often, we're sinful people and we allow sin to overtake us. And we get caught up into things. And things just happen. And before we know it, we went against your will. And we pray at this time that you will forgive us for those sins. And we know that you sent your son Jesus to die on that cross so that we could be forgiven. We ask all these things in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father. Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have some special music. I think Bernita has a song that she likes to sing. Good morning. share with everybody and sometimes you look at people and you don't know what they're going through so you sing a song like this and you thank you for the blessings that you have then God knows that you're out here and you're letting him know what you need so there's always hope for the future and think with a positive attitude and you'll be blessed if it's if it's nothing if somebody smiles at you on the street they smile at you. Smile back and go on. You've been blessed. So I uh, hope you appreciate this song. As the world looks upon me, as I struggle along, they say,
Thank you, Carol. So I'm not going to have the kids come up, but I just was thinking about something that uh, was in the sermon on Easter, if anybody picked up on it or not, but uh, Stephanie Turner actually posted this quote the other day, and it's, uh, if, and, and, and I'm not saying it exactly right, but basically if you always live in sunshine, eventually you'll be in a desert. And I think that's important to remember, because this week was a... Uh, a little cold, a little misty like, a little, a little nasty. Wasn't the nicest to be out every day. But you know what? If all we had was sunshine here, what would happen? It would never rain. It, it, would, it never rain. Okay. Gardens would dry up. Everything the gardens would dry up? Just be sane. Everything would die. Everything would, I don't know if everything would die, but it, lots of things would die. We wouldn't appreciate the sunshine anymore. We're kind of on Bryce's thing, that we'd have to figure out other ways to get water, wouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, so it's just, yeah. Northern, that was it Northern California that's got all the, the drought, and Southern California that's got all the flooding right now. Or I would have that switched. I think that's the way it is. I don't remember exactly. But having, it, it kind of just, that quote struck, stuck with me because when we were in Egypt, it doesn't rain. And that was so foreign to us. And one of the reasons that everything looks dirty and grimy is because guess what? It doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. And we may think something looks dirty and grimy, but a good rain shower will do what? It'll wash your house off. It'll wash off things. Like, you know, it does that. If you always had sunshine, eventually you just live in a desert. And so sometimes we have to go through those dark periods. Sometimes we have to go through those stormy periods and those rain showers and those periods that aren't so great to make us truly appreciate the sunshiny days that we have. And so I just thought that was kind of important to share with everybody. I just have never, ever thought about that. But having gone to Egypt and being able to look at, I don't know what they call it, but I know what the rosemary's been there. But when you, you sit on that boat and you look out at the Nile, and in most places, I can't read, is it the arid zone, they call it? Yeah. But it's the point where the, the water evaporates and it becomes totally dry. But because of the Nile, it's about six feet in Egypt. Most places, it's about a mile or so. So that things start just tapering off and, and it gets drier and drier as you go out. But in Egypt, it, so it was so fascinating. You set up there and pan from Tug, you could see exactly where the desert started, <clears throat> because it's just how far out the Nile would, would uh, flood out. You can see the, the line. It was literally however a line. However far they pumped. Or however far they pumped, because anything that was grown out that's for crops or anything was pumped out of the Nile. So actually, some of them didn't pump. Some of them had the horse or the donkey that they lower the big bucket into, and then they hook the donkey up and the donkey would walk and it would raise the bucket out of the and then they'd swing the sucker around and they three or four people have to do it but they dump that bucket into those roads and they did that all day long so <clears throat> I don't want to do that <laughs> so let's open our hymnals to 348 and we're going to sing my savior's love we will sing the first second and fourth
we're going to continue on for the next several Sundays through Galatians. We're actually going to go through that whole book. But don't get too worried. It's not that long of a book. <laughs> but uh, we're focusing on Paul and uh, Paul's letter to Galatians and, and some of the real pieces that kind of made the church into what we know it today. And if you remember last week, some of it was a... Uh, now I can't remember last week. Um, <laughs> teaching from uh, whether the, the, whether you had to be Jewish and Jewish. Jewish before you could be Christian, and whether you had to be Christian and follow Jewish rules. And uh, one was saying yes, you have to be, and Paul was saying absolutely not. That is not what Jesus taught us. So Galatians 1, 10 through twenty four. This is going to finish up the first book of Galatians. There's only six books, so it's not like it's going to be that long. Now, I'm trying to win the approval of it. This is Paul talking. Am I trying to win it? I'll just keep starting again. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would, could not, be, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that's going to come into play later. If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. A boss one time told me, if somebody's not mad at you, you're not doing your job right. <laughs> There's a school principal, but probably pretty true. Mm -hmm. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. If you remember, there were some people calling Paul, kind of calling him on the carpet, because he wasn't directly taught by Jesus, and we will get into that more today. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and did have tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age among our, my people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before us, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. And that's important to know that he did not go to Jerusalem to see any of the apostles. He went to Arabia after his revelation. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days. And if you don't know who Cephas is, Cephas is Peter. And Peter had three different names, Simon, Peter, and Cephas. Okay? So it gets a little confusing in the epistles when they're talking about Cephas, who Cephas was, Peter. Okay? And I stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And I assure you before God that I am writing you to is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Sicilia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that, that are in Christ. They had only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. So this section sets up Paul as a primary source. Okay? Now, if you don't know the difference between a primary source and a secondary source, you're getting ready to find out. Okay? But if you've ever been a history major or you're in college or anything, you're going to know that there's primary sources and there's secondary sources. Primary sources mean I witnessed something myself. I was there. Okay? Secondary sources is what somebody told me they witnessed. Okay? Primary sources, and there's also primary learning and secondary learning. So primary learning means you learn at the master's feet. You learn from the person themselves. Secondary sources are you learn from someone who learned from them. Okay? So if I learned how to paint from someone who was taught by Rembrandt, I'm a secondary sources, source. If I learn from Rembrandt himself, I'm a primary source. Okay? <laughs> now, I'd be pretty old too. <laughs> And this is kind of important to point out because nobody around anymore even thinks about Jesus as a primary source. And we're going to touch on this in a little bit, but it's so foreign to us because we're so many years removed to think that there were people who really knew Jesus. 
You have people that said, I know Jesus in my heart. That, uh, that there were people who literally knew Jesus. And at that time period, only 20 or 30 years removed from Jesus' resurrection, there were people who could still claim, I heard him speak. I was taught by him. Okay? So there were 12 primary sources. Actually, there were a lot of primary sources because anyone that heard him speak was was the primary source, but there were 12 main ones, and they were called the apostles. Okay? And as soon as Judas committed suicide, uh, shortly afterward, Christ's resurrection in the book of Acts, we found out they elected the 12th back, and they elected Matthias. But he had heard Jesus speak. Now you think about that, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that you actually heard Jesus Christ speak. But there were people who did. Okay? Now if you're in a court or in a scholarly setting, you want primary sources. If you're in a court, they will not call you to the witness stand unless you're a primary source. Because if you're a secondary source, it's called hearsay. hearsay. It's called hearsay. Because you're just reporting what somebody else said. Okay? I told you. <clears throat> so, for courts and scholarly purposes, a lot of times they want the primary sources. For Christianity, the primary source is the ones that were taught by Jesus himself. And how many do you think we have in the world anymore? None. Uh, nobody is around anymore. Okay? But what do we have of people that wrote that people did hear Jesus speak and wrote it down? What do we call that? Bible. Yeah. Okay. And that's why sometimes it's called the divine inspired word of God. But it was written down by someone. Okay? And there was controversy arising there because Paul was not directly by Jesus, taught directly by Jesus. He came along later. Well, it was going to happen eventually, wasn't it? Because as the generations moved on, there were people who were not going to know, uh, who had, did not know or had not heard Jesus speak. Okay? I'm preaching this morning, but I did not hear Jesus speak. Nor did he come to me in a revelation. Okay? I'm doing secondary. All right? But some people at that period of time, because they knew so many people who had heard Jesus, didn't think that Paul was legit because he didn't actually hear Jesus speak. And Paul is trying to tell these people, and that's kind of the beginning of the scripture, uh, he wants to state his feelings on things. I am now, I am now trying to win the approval of human being. Am, there I go again with that. Am I now trying to win the approval of human <coughs> beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? And he goes on to say rather strongly, if I were trying to please people, I could not be a servant of Christ. Because if I was just trying to please you, guess what? I'd be telling you whatever you want to hear. Be a politician. i tell you whatever you want to hear, because that keeps me popular. Paul states that he is not just telling people his interpretations of things. He says, first, Paul takes us through a in this, this section, Paul will take us through a series of statements to try to prove that. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not, human origin meaning it's a secondary source. It, it, I didn't hear it from another human. I heard it from Jesus. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. How intensely I per persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And if you study back in there, Paul was not a good guy when he was Saul. He was not a good person. He was very scholarly. He was well known, uh, well known as a young rabbi candidate in the Jewish faith. He knew the laws and he was out there persecuting Christians like crazy. But Paul did have one thing that was interesting that a lot of the other disciples did not have. And Paul was a Roman citizen. Okay? Because as a Roman citizen, you were entitled to a great deal more authority and a great deal more rights and things than the other apostles had. So it made him very key in getting the gospel spread. And if you even, I think if you look in the back of the Bible, you're going to see a, a, a map of Paul's travels. Okay? Paul could participate, uh, Paul was a full-born Roman citizen, which means he could vote, he could marry free-born persons, 
and practice commerce. Okay? And practice commerce, which meant he could deal directly with other Roman citizens. Now, we hear the apostles that were fishermen and so forth. They fished, they practiced commerce, but they didn't necessarily practice commerce with the Romans. They practiced commerce with their own people. They sold their fish to the Jewish people. And it wasn't uncommon for the Jewish people to even have an overlord that was Roman. Okay? So it's, it, no one knows for sure, but it is possible that Simon, I'm trying to remember the name, the two that were fishers of men, Okay, y'all don't know what either, so I'm going to get <laughs> It's possible that a Roman person owned with the boat, and they did the fishing, and then the Roman person took so much of their profit. It was similar to a sharecropping kind of thing, or rental for land, or whatever. It, it's, it's not uncommon. But Paul could practice commerce outright, and he had the right to vote. Okay? He could participate in the government. The other 12 could not. They were not Roman citizens. Uh, and therefore, they had no rights under the law. So if they wanted to, one of the apostles, the Romans just got rid of them. Not with Paul. Paul was a Roman citizen, so he had the right to a court trial, which makes things very different. Okay? Paul was placed at the exact right time, at the exact right point in of, of the world, where he should be to get the gospel spread. And what he is arguing is, is, you can say I'm not legit, but I saw Jesus. He came to me in a revelation. There were people around me who knew I was blinded for three days. I was set apart from my mother's womb. I realize now, I was set apart. Because not only was he very, he, did he become very strong Christian, but if you listened, he was a very strong Jew. So he knew the Jewish laws. He knew the things that they were trying to push. And he realized after his conversion that not all these are right. You also got to remember that as a young man, Paul hated Christians. Hated them. Saul was a young man who was well educated. On his way to becoming a rabbi, he was zealous about his Jewish faith. And he's first mentioned in the New Testament as being present at the stoning of Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr. Acts 7, 57 says, As they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, stoning would be bad enough, but I looked up kind of how this may have happened. We think that they just picked up rocks and threw it at him. No. They dragged him outside and more than likely put him in the corner of a wall or in a pit, and then through rocks. Why? Because you couldn't get away. <laughs> if you could just run away, you could eventually outrun them. But if they wanted to stone you to death, they had a way to do it so you couldn't get away. And who was standing there watching the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr? A young rabbi to be named Saul. Hmm. Now, it didn't say anything about Saul throwing any rocks, because he was probably high enough in the ranks that he didn't throw the rocks. He just told everybody else to throw the rocks. Right? Keep those hands clean. He was a bit of a politician. Right? Acts 8.3 says, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And we've got to remember that Paul's name that we talk about now was actually Saul at one point. And Saul is one of the well-known Jewish names throughout history. Okay? Saul. Okay? Jewish names throughout history is Saul. King Saul. Okay? Better call Saul. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times, Saul is a big Jewish name, and Saul could be a derivative of Solomon. Okay? The first part of Solomon, S-O-L, but S-A-E-U-L, Saul, could be a shortened version of Solomon. Uh, Acts chapter 7 and 8 describe Paul's fair persecution of Christians, but chapter 9 begins Jesus' revelation to him. Now, secondly, Galatians 1 15 says, But when God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, 
my immediate response was not to consult any human being. So he's trying to set himself up, okay, this was all revealed to me, but if you're saying I just learned this from other people, I'm going to give you some evidence that I didn't. Because after my conversion, I did not go to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles. I went to Arabia. Now why is that important? Because the church hadn't expanded to Arabia. Arabia didn't have Jewish people in it. So how did he know all of this stuff that he spent three years in Arabia? Later, I returned to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, or Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brothers. And I assure you before God that I am writing to you as no lie. So what he's trying to say is, is those people that are saying, I just learned this by listening to the other apostles, I wasn't even aware of it. I was in Arabia for three years. So it'd be like being a witness, it would be like being a, accused of something in court, and you saying, I got an alibi. You can't accuse me of this because I wasn't even there. And how many times has something happened in your life and you thought, Glad I wasn't there for that one. All right. Glad I didn't see that. Because right. I'd be in on it. I don't want to be in on that. Right. I do find it interesting that he mentions that he did see James, the brother of the Lord. Okay. Who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Because he is trying to set out that I did talk to James at one point. So don't let anybody say, I saw you talking to Jerusalem. I saw you in Jerusalem talking to James. I did talk to him at one point, but I went there long enough to get anything done, basically. Okay. This may seem to ramble a bit, but it's important. It's an important part is to know that Paul states that he was set apart from other people to preach to the Gentiles. And that's what I meant by Paul was put in the right place at the right time, etc. The church at this point was starting to become a little insular. Meaning, they weren't branching the way they could have. They were getting comfortable. The Church of Galatia was getting comfortable. They were arguing amongst themselves when they should have been doing what? Going out and looking for new people, that kind of thing. The Church is, uh, at uh, Ephesians, kind of the same thing. Everybody gets to a point where you reach things that are kind of comfortable, and so you don't want to change anything. And then what happens? That kind of slow decline that, that, that comes on sometimes. And Paul's trying to do it. I mean, Paul was kind of arguing, I've been placed here to push that out. I'm a Roman citizen. I can go into these places and preach this and not get hung or not get stoned because I'm Roman. So Paul also adds this last part to an attempt to prove that he was, his conversion was by revelation from Jesus. And he says, I did not go to Jerusalem and learn from others. Meaning, I didn't go learn from secondary sources. I learned as a primary source in a revelation from Jesus. Now also keep in mind, you've got apostles who also had revelations from Jesus. Who appeared to them several different times in the first 40 days before he ascended into heaven. Jesus appeared to the apostles. So it wasn't hard for them to understand that maybe Jesus did appear to him. He appeared to us. We saw him. Thomas could say, I stuck my finger in the hole. The doubting Thomas story. So I'm trying to get you to realize that we are so far removed from this sometimes that it's hard to think of people that Jesus, that knew Jesus and that he appeared to them and could say that. Now we have people nowadays that say Jesus appeared to me in a cloud in the sky and we say they're crazy. crazy. They're not our they're not all right. Now, if you're in the Catholic Church and you can prove all that, you can become a saint. Okay? How many saints do they make a year? Not many. Okay? Because there's, you've got to have a proof piece. Just a little side note here, though, is Paul is trying to say, look at what an amazing case I am myself. I was an absolutely horrible person. I persecuted Christians. And it was God's amazing grace that saved me. And through God's amazing grace, amazing, amazing, grace, amazing grace, I am here trying to show you what that amazing grace is. Because I am no longer the person I was. I was Saul and now I am Paul. 
I've changed and I want you to listen to me. And he starts preaching that grace is free and it's the unmerited favor of God and it works powerfully in our minds and hearts to change our lives and it is for all people. All people. Not just because you follow the Jewish customs. Okay? Not because you don't follow the Jewish customs. It's for all people. No one is so good that they do not need the grace of the gospel, and so no one is so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Now, I'm going to say that again so it sticks. No one is so good that they do not need the grace of the gospel, and no one is so bad that they can't receive it. Okay? Now, there's a qualifier in that last one. They can't receive it. You can be so bad and, and that you choose not to receive the gospel. But Paul is saying no one is so bad that if they do choose it, they can have it. Okay. C.S. Lewis, one of the most prolific Christian authors, I'm a fan of C.S. Lewis, stated, Christianity must come from God because who else could have thought it up? Okay. If you're not familiar with C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis wrote The Lion, of Witch, and Wardrobe. He wrote the screw tape letters. He wrote uh, all kinds of different things. He was a famous atheist. He did not believe in God whatsoever. Okay. His conversion was not like Paul's. Paul's came very suddenly. He was blinded. C.S. Lewis's came little by little over time. Okay. And for those of you just some trivia, C.S. Lewis was also the editor for uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings. And so he did a lot of uh, different kinds of work. But he converted like Paul, but like I said, it was a little bit of time. And he became eventually one of the most prolific Christian writers of the 19th century. Okay. Uh, Mere Christianity. If you ever get a chance to read that book, it's not easy, but it's a wonderful book. C.S. Lewis once had a professor by the name of William T. Kirkpatrick. And don't worry, I'll bring this back to Paul in a minute. But William T. Kirkpatrick was known as the Great Knock. That was his nickname among his students, the Great Knock. I don't know why, it just was. Okay? But he was an atheist, and he was a strong atheist, and he taught debate. So he taught people how to attack Christianity from a very logical argument. And he taught those skills to C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis used those skills to tear down arguments that God existed. But in a funny turn of fate, when C.S. Lewis converted, he used his training to logically argue that God did exist. A lot like Paul. C.S. Lewis and Paul are quite a bit alike. They were both adamant that they were against Christians, and through their personal life experiences and the things they had learned when they converted, it made them that much stronger as a Christian because they could see it from the other side. Okay. I don't know about you all, but sometimes when you can see something from the other side of the fence, it just looks different. Now, it also looks different if you've been on that side of the fence once and then came over here and then went back. And I firmly believe C.S. Lewis used Paul, or God used C.S. Lewis and Paul in very, simple, very similar ways to reach people who weren't listening. Paul was the arrogant, young, upstart Jew that persecuted Christians who was changed by God's amazing grace. Galatians 1.23, Paul says, The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praise God because of me. It was no accident that God used one who understood the opposition to convert more people to Christianity than anyone else. And that's the lesson for today, is it was no accident that God chose someone who understood the opposition so greatly that he was able to convert more people to Christianity than anyone else in history. Amen. So, it just seems logical to sing Amazing Grace right now. <clears throat> Thank you.
We will sing one, three, and five.